In this episode, we're talking about the benefits of using games in the language classroom. I'm joined by Kevin Quigley, a French teacher in Vermont, who describes the linguistic benefits of games and gives us many suggestions to use right away in our classrooms. So let's jump in. Are you a language teacher looking for some reassurance that what you're doing in the classroom is on the right track? Or maybe you're looking for some ways to teach even more effectively. If you're one or the other or somewhere in between, you've landed in the right place. This is the World Language Classroom Podcast with your host, me, Joshua Cabral. You're about to get tips, tools, and resources so that your students continue to rise in proficiency and communicate with confidence. Let's jump in. Vamos, allons-y. Hello, my friends. Bonjour, mes amis. Hola, mis amigos. Welcome to the World Language Classroom Podcast. I am Joshua Cabral, and as always, I am so incredibly thankful that you are here, that you want to think about your teaching, hear what other teachers are doing, so that you can bring it back into your classroom, reassured you're doing great stuff, maybe modify a little, whatever that is for you. Thank you for being here and for being that awesome teacher that you are. While you're listening real quickly, before we jump into our topic, if you could just look down at the app on your phone and make sure that you press, you know, subscribe or follow whatever the app's asking you to do to make sure that you get all these episodes, that would be the best thing for you. So you don't have to, you know, wait for an email or see it pop up. It'll just be there. And the other thing is you might want to leave a review, you know, because that helps other teachers uh, to find the podcast as well. Okay, so now we're going to jump into our topic for this episode, which is all about games and activities. And I know from what I hear from teachers when they're looking on blogs and looking on social media and engaging in conversations, listening to podcasts, teachers like actionable things they can do in their classroom sort of tomorrow, next week. How can I do this? And when it comes to games and activities, we're always looking for those great things. So today we are joined by Kevin Quigley. And uh, Kevin is another one of those great presenters that I have seen personally at conferences. And so when I was looking for people to talk about different concepts and topics, I said, I have been in a workshop with Kevin Quigley, and so I know that he will add a lot to this conversation. So I reached out to him. So Kevin is a French and Spanish teacher. He's been teaching for about 15 years. Now, he's currently in the United States, um, in Vermont and New Hampshire, and that area is where he's been teaching uh, for the, about the last six years. So prior to that, he taught in Switzerland and Korea, and he's Irish. So that's kind of where his world started. And I am so thankful to have him with us today to help us navigate and just add some games and activities to our repertoire of teaching. So hello, Kevin, and welcome to the World Language Classroom podcast. Hello, how are you doing? I am doing quite well, and I'm very excited to learn about games. Well, I'm so and I'm glad that you mentioned the Irishness because um, that's why the, that's why the, the accent is there. I have since being in the States, I have on two occasions I'll be in a store and I'll be like um, just making small like small talk with the person and they'll congratulate me on how good my English is. And <laughs> just because they, they hear the accent, they assume that I'm like a non anyway. So um, but yes, that's why I have an accent. Um, so just putting it out there. Well, your English is very good, Kevin. I Thanks. have to it's tell been, you. I've been working on it for 42 years, so it should <laughs> so it should be. Yeah. So um, I would love to hear a little more about your story. Why, why French and Spanish? Why do you keep doing it? Um, fill in some of those blanks for us. But I, I studied French uh, at university in the UK. And because we have like, you know, free college education, I was had the luxury of studying something that I was just really interested in. And I, I just I've always loved French, um, French language, French literature, culture. So I got my master's and um, I had other plans. So I spent about 10 years traveling, um, kind of working here and there and fell into teaching when I ran out of money and um, <laughs> was actually in Chicago. Um, this is back in 06, was in Chicago. And back then, um, Korea, were, they were South Korea, desperate for teachers. And all you needed to have was a degree and 
good English skills, which as mm -hmm. we've established, I have. So um, <laughs> right. anyway, so I ended up in, in Korea. And then um, when it came to, came to the States, um, I applied for a job as a French teacher and found that I, I loved it. I never had the same satisfaction teaching English as I do. Mm -hmm. I think partly because I don't really know, you know, with English, when people ask, used to ask me, oh, why is it this and not that? I had no idea because I never, mm -hmm. I never really learned English. Um, but um, yeah, so um, I kind of started French teaching, um, yeah, in 2016, um, and loved it, and just and mm -hmm. loved it. And I, and then more recently, um, started teaching Spanish. Why do I keep doing it? My priority in the classroom, my number one priority, isn't to teach French or Spanish. My number one priority is to create community. Um, and if, as a product of that or a byproduct of that, if we learn some some language, that's great. But my number one priority is to is to build community, and that's where the games come in. Right. So, well, yeah. let's then talk about the games and let's how we're it. using them to build community. So, yeah. Yeah. what is your reasoning for you know games being so important, or just student engagement in general? Why is that important for me? Games. And like so some of the activities that I'll, I'll talk about, you know, they're not, they're not sort of things that I just do at the end of class for the last three minutes. And they're not, it's not just about brain breaks. Like some of my classes, I'm on a block schedule, so 80 minute classes. Some of my classes are just playing games. And you've, like, I'm doing the air quotes because I, I think that sometimes we, you know, we sort of have this notion that you're, you're just, you're just playing games. But I think the, the, yeah, they can actually be a core part of, of what we do in the classroom. I think that's a, a common misconception about games is, yeah. you know, it's it's really just about fun. And it can be because it's community building. Yeah. And that's something that our yeah. students, you know, really do need right now, particularly now in a challenging educational situation. But, you know, there there is language learning and acquiring going on in there. And so mm -hmm. for teachers that might be thinking, I don't know if I want to do, you know, games all the time, all these activities, and I'm going to say games. I mean, sometimes we say enrichment mm -hmm. activities and things like that because it's better than saying games. But let's use the term mm -hmm. games because games have a fun mm -hmm. component to it. And so mm -hmm. when teachers might be thinking, you know, it's it's just about like having fun and there's no language like how like can you speak yeah. to where the language learning and acquiring comes in through games yeah i think that's for me that's the, you know, the number one misconception is or well number i feel like number one misconception is games are just things that you do at the end or to fill time um, or to give kids a chance to move around and I, I i don't think that is the case and then the second thing like again all of my games are it, it's target language practice and I have um, two games kind of like that focus on listening um, two for writing and then two for, um, for speaking I think the other thing I would say is I'm, I'm really glad that you said let's use the word games because I call like a lot of things games that when I describe them to you you'll be like well that's not really a game and I'm like well I don't really care because I call them games my kids like my students will think that they're games and then they'll want to play them and so I just I use the I use the word all the time and then they'll be like Oh, and they get really excited. They'll be like, oh, can we play like this game? They get excited. And yeah, but I think that we can find, you know, games, again, let's call them, let's call it that games or activities, whatever, that aren't just about filling time and have rich opportunities for, for language ac acquisition and can be used also for assessment. But those two things, you know, I think sometimes we sort of think, you know, we do the class stuff and then we assess it and then we have the games. But I think we can maybe be a bit more fluid, a little bit more organic and use the games to assess. We need to. Yeah. I mean, I definitely see as students are engaging in games, different activities, that there's a lot of formative assessment that's going yeah. on as you hear what they're yeah. doing. So there's definitely that formative assessment piece and, you know, maybe even some summative assessment in there. But I would, and I'm very excited about this, I would love to hear about some games that you do that have been effective that we could try out in our own classrooms. So I'm going to rattle down a list. And if I am not being clear on anything, just stop me and be the voice of the, the listener and, and, okay. and tell me. I'm taking notes from my class tomorrow. Excellent. So if anything's not clear, you're going to hear it. 
<laughs> so the first two, I'll, I'll do. I'll start with two um, listening kind of games that kind of are for listening. Certainly, the first one you can do on the first day of school um, with like, like absolute beginners. In in French, I just it's changer de place or cambier de siècle. So students in a circle, and you're just going to list off various things such as you know change places if you're wearing. You're doing this in the target language, but change places if you're wearing red change places if you like chicken change places and then you just students get up uh, and change places um what i will do with this game um just to scaffold it a little bit is you know so it's the first day of school you know and i'll write on the board so let's take a, a french class for example you know i'll write on the board changer de place si dot 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 so change places if and then i'll and maybe we'll just put three or four examples like si tu si tu m if you like um si tu portes if you're wearing um, si tu veux, if you want, or si tu as, if you have, just those. Um, and then it's, a, it's as simple as I'll walk around the circle and I'll say, changer de place, si tu portes, and I'll point at the board so they can see, and I'll, you know, kind of indicate that I'm talking about clothing. And then I will just, you know, changer de place, si tu portes, bleu, and I'll hold up a blue marker or hold up something blue, just giving them as much, you know, they've got the words on the board, um, using props if I can, cognates as well. So, for example, on the first day of school, changer de place, si tu aimes, if you like, changer de place, si tu aimes, la pizza, changer de place, si tu aimes, le chocolat, really, really straightforward. And then obviously with older kids, you can make it more advanced. What I would then, the differentiation, um, between sort of younger and older kids or lower levels and, and sort of more advanced. The more with the beginners, I will just, I'm giving them the input and I will I will do several rounds and then eventually I'll start taking chairs away um, to, to sort of to build that kind of um, interest in the game. With the older kids, we just have, I'll usually start it off and we'll just have one less chair than there are people. And so whoever gets left in the middle, they have to think of something to say to the rest of the class. So you're getting, you're, they're getting some, you know, they're having to do some output as well. The, th the thing that I love about that game is, again, you can do it on day one. And, and I have a ton of props in my room. So I have a whole bag of like stuff, stuffed animals. So like, you know, change the place, you know, change places if you have a chat or a chien. Um, I have like a whole bag of like um, plastic fruits and like, foodstuffs so c2m if you like whatever strawberries bananas whatever it might be um yeah it's really simple and kids love it and again from for day one it's great and it gets them up and gets them up and moving around should i move on to my second listening so the second one i'm really um again this is maybe not i would say not necessarily for the first day of school maybe when you've had a bit of when there's been a bit of content or you've had, they've had some input. The marker, gra marker grab game, and I'm sure a lot of people will know exactly what this is. I play this with the markers on the floor. You can also do it at tables, it's up to you. Two teams, they're in a line facing each other. So usually about three or four feet apart, maybe a bit less. Put a marker down between each pair vertically. So the marker is kind of sitting, you know, sitting up. And then all you do is you, you say a statement in the target language. So, you know, today is Tuesday, or I don't know. I sometimes go like really kind of like, you know, the, I don't know, the capital of Vermont is Montpelier, whatever it might be. Or you can do history, you can do geography, you can do all sorts of things. Um, or talk about the story or talk about whatever you've been talking about in class. If the statement is true, they grab a marker. If it is false, they don't grab it. If they grab it and it's true, they get a point for their team. And if they grab it and it's false, they get a point off. Again, the one thing I love about this game is they will, like, I've never seen students, like, listen so intently. Like, they're so, so focused. So it's great. It's great. Um, and I will take a long time to think of things to say. And just in the meantime, I'm just enjoying the silence because they really will, they'll focus on it. And I usually do first to, depends on the number of kids, mm -hmm. but usually first team to 20, um, for example. Um, but again, really fun. So each team, again, they're one team is facing the other. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's usually a good time. Um, what I will suggest is that you tell them at the beginning, if they both grab the marker, then they just get a point each, and then that avoids that avoids them like coming to blows, over, which is not worth you know it's not worth it. Um, so, mm -hmm. so yeah, those are both like my go-to like listening activity like listening games. So it's two things actually. I want to kind of just unpack a little bit about those. The first one is something teachers will really appreciate, and that there's essentially no prep. <laughs> you know, because, you know, you put some markers out or you stand in a circle, you know, and you're just you're making the language up 
on the spot based on what your content area is of in that unit and there's you can do it at any time because there's no prep it's that's it's, it's so great the only thing you know with i think with sometimes with the, with the marker grab game i will periodically i will struggle of you know to think of something to say but i mean so i end up resorting to things like you know in this room at the moment there are 10 people and then they have to furiously count you know how many people or um you know john's socks are blue or mary's mask is red anything i mean you can anything works yeah and i'm i'm really i'm thinking you know personally about my own classroom and using these i'm thinking um and you gave some examples that were kind of novice level yeah. um, but i'm thinking all the way through like your prompts could be you know change places if uh, you went to this place last weekend where yeah. you're using language in the past tense or mm -hmm. even the marker grab is I'm going to uh, tell a story, and as soon as you hear a change in the time frame, mm -hmm. uh, pull the marker. You know, mm -hmm. so I think mm -hmm. that there are ways of making these higher proficiency level, even. Mm -hmm. and I, that's a that's a great idea, which I'm going to steal. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, I think that's it's again it ties in with some of these misconceptions, like the, that we think that games are just for for novice you know level or for you know they're for like it's for elementary school but like my juniors like it's, they're always asking to play games like they, they are still kids like they want to they want to have yeah. fun so yeah. all right yeah. what else you got in the bag for us okay so um a couple of just um writing games um first one is categories um i usually do this in teams i have a whole um sort of like several slides just ready to go i mean they're super easy to make and i'm sure you can probably find examples online, but usually six categories, something red, a historical figure, something that you're scared of, a city, anything at all you can you can think of. You don't even have to have a slideshow. You can just write it up on the board, um, write up a letter again. So you, ha you have the categories, you think of a random letter. I will always, I always do it in groups. I just, I like them to just be in groups to do this rather than it being, because I feel like if they're doing it on their own, then it becomes, it feels like more of a task than more of a game so they have them do it in, in, in teams the nice thing of course is as they're doing it i usually give them three minutes maybe more i will quickly just run down the list and see if we, see if i can actually think of something um and then sometimes i'll have to quickly go to my computer and just look up oh gosh is there an actual is there a state that begins with that letter that letter and then you know scoring you know one point if you um get a valid word um or two points if you get a valid word that no other team got. Really simple. Um, again, they're they're having to think of things in the target language, but just getting them to sort of start activating their memory and what words they have in their long-term memory. It's not it's not sophisticated. You know, they're not creating sentences or stories. I've got plenty of other games for creating stories, but this is just a really quick, almost no prep activity. The other one. Other one, which I do, it's funny, I did this with my, so we have a, an advisory program, like a, I don't know what people call it, but like a, a TA. And I did it with, I have a ninth grade TA, so I did it with them mm -hmm. the other day. And as I was doing it with them, I was like, I should do this with my, with my French class. And I put them in teams and there were two rounds. The first round, what they had to do was in their teams, make a list and just one person was writing. They had to make a list in their teams of things that they had in common um, in the group. And so with my, so I did it later on that day with mm -hmm. my French class, mm -hmm. and it allowed me to speak very briefly about like using nous versus on, for example. Um, so you're gonna, I said to you, you're gonna wanna say like mm -hmm. either, you know, nous avons tous un chien or on a tous un chien, whatever you might, you might wanna say, you know, we, we all have a dog. So it's an opportunity to use different subject pronouns rather than always exactly. the, the first person singular, je. So you do that first round. Um, so using uh, again, mostly they were using new. So these are the, these are the, the, the list of things that we have in common. Um, after that first round, you know they count up, and whoever gets the most on their list, they get. Well, actually, I think they just got whatever, however, however many they got. That was the number of points that they got. So in that first round, like I was saying, they all um, you know they're thinking of things that they all have in common, and then they get points. Um, however many items they have on their, on their list, that's the number of points that they, that's, that, they, that they get. But it allows me afterwards to, you know, to take those um, lists and to, to say, oh, well, all of, group, all of this group 
we're all born in Vermont or all of this group have dogs and we can kind of I can ask individuals different questions and and really milk it for mm -hmm. for and there's a whole lot you could do with that and then the second round is kind of the opposite what they'd have to do is come up with a list of things that only one person um like attributes mm -hmm. or things that are, are unique to only one person in the group and again there they're using um third person so you know mary has a dog and she's the only one that has a dog um what i have them do is i have have them avoid physical right. characteristics mm -hmm. um i just but talking about anything else, I think it is fine, but just avoiding physical characteristics. Um, it was really, it was really mm -hmm. great. Um, again, and then it allows me to, you know, they're writing those lists in third person. I can then take them and then ask questions in the, you know, second person getting, getting, giving them that sort of chance to, you know, answer those questions and, mm -hmm. and talk about those things. Yeah. And, um, Again, thinking of what do you have in common in terms of what you did last weekend mm -hmm. or what you're going to do next week, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, it can sort of sound like a, a simple task, mm -hmm. but the the prompt is what changes the proficiency level. Yeah, but again, you can, yeah, like you said, you can push them to to go a little bit further and mm -hmm. think in, think about the future, think about the past, um, yeah. think about things that they might want to do. So, yeah. Okay. What's another game in the bag? So two more. So these are both sort of mm -hmm. speaking um, and 20 mm -hmm. questions, super, um, super straightforward. I know I'm pretty sure it's um, Senora Chase um, on her website has um, a template that you can use. You can find other ones. I've, I've created my own. Again, you can write it on the board or you just can project the, the, the slide. It's just one slide and it's just asking, just having basic questions in the target language, getting them to think about categories of things. And I think that's something you've talked about is that um, we, and I, it really struck a chord. I think you talked about this recently where um, we learned all of these words in school, but we never learned the, the <laughs> overarching category, which was just, it was so mind blowing for me. I was like, like, yeah, absolutely. How do we even begin to describe, you know, today in class, I had a, an eighth grade group and we were doing a, a movie talk and there's a fox in it. And I said, okay, I'm going to leave the room. And I do this all the time with my kids and it's great. I'm, I'm going to leave the room. I'm going to give you guys 25 seconds. When I come back in, you know, I, want you, I want you to, to have talked to one another. When I come back in, I want you to, to describe to me what a fox is. So you've just seen a fox. You want to tell your French friend that you've just seen a fox. How would you do that? And I came back in and I realized that they weren't sure that how to say animal because in previously, they had learned, you know, chien, cha, whatever. They'd never learned animal. That is going to be that's in some ways that's more important than learning. All, you know, it was just it was just crazy to me. So I, you know, when I came in, they said chien rouge, and I was like, oh, you saw a red dog. But if they'd if been able to say say animal, anyway, twenty questions is good for I think just start mm -hmm. getting them, you know, to 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 think about like a little bit of like circumlocution and sort of describing things, but. Again, I will think of a, uh, an object, you know, they're in, they're going to be in teams. I'll think of it or a person, whoever it might be. They have the questions on the board and in their teams, you know, one team will ask me a question. I'll give them the answer to that question. The next team will answer, will ask a question. It allows for a lot of input because then I will repeat, mm -hmm. you know, I'll say, okay, yes, the person is alive. The person is American and I'll go back. Yes, the person is alive and I'll repeat it every single time. So do you have the same questions that they're referencing when you're doing this? Every time I play, it's the same list of questions okay. that I have every single time. Um, and then they can just refer to it. And it's, but I you say, I always will tell them that it's just the guy. You don't have to ask those questions. And it's nice to see them start to, the more we play it, they start to kind of think of their own questions. And some of them don't even look at the, the slideshow anymore, but it's there just again as a scaffold yeah. just to help you know to, to um yeah. give kids that support if they if they need it i was in a uh, an actful uh it was some sort of opi oral proficiency interview workshop and talking about the different levels and one of the areas that was talked about that was really challenging for students to sort of level up in was question asking mm -hmm. and it's because in the classroom 
typically it's always the teacher mm -hmm. asking the questions and students are answering. So when it came to sort of testing proficiency levels with speakers, they would struggle with asking questions, mm -hmm. you know, and we have this impression that as teachers, but questions happen all the time in the classroom. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, 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 we ask questions all the time in the classroom, but not students. Yeah. So this activity is giving them the opportunity to work on that skill. I and mean, question forming is hard, or it can be hard. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of, like, like, for like, you know, beginners, when I like, you know, when they look, when I go over to my wall and I point at Kesker and they're just like, what on earth is that monstrosity? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole lot of, you know, <laughs> far too many like, yeah, use and like, yeah. Um, so yeah, getting them just to ask questions. And then the nice thing with, with, with 20 questions is that it's sometimes I will do this. And if I, particularly if I have to, if I have to conference with the student during class for whatever reason, or just, if there's something that I want to mm -hmm. go over, some, like, some student will always be willing to, to volunteer to be the person. Um, because it's one of those things where they can, the student who's up at the front, it actually doesn't have to do a whole lot of work. It's actually kind of, it's low, you know, because so often when you have one student at the front, they're having to do a whole lot and it can be kind of stressful. Whereas that person is just responding um, to questions. So super, super simple. Yeah. And you can, again, figure out the, the rules yourselves about when to, um, to, to end. Mm -hmm. I just let it, I, I just keep it going. Yeah. Uh, and, and Another it. very low prep kind of activity. Yeah. Oh, I'm, love. I mean, well, I'm all, honestly, like, I'm all about the low prep. Um, all about it. Anyway, um, the last one is, um, again, it's also really low prep. Um, the only thing you need to do is just figure out seating for this one. And it's slightly tricky just to, to describe, but essentially what you're going to do, I think it's called, I don't know, I call it hot seat. I think that's, I don't know mm -hmm. if there's another name for it. But let's say, imagine we have 15 students in the class. You're going to split them into teams of five, so three teams of five. So if you each team, four people on the team will face the board and one person will face the team with their back to the board. And you, again, will just go up to the board and you will write a word or a phrase or a it could be anything at all. And it could be as simple as red. And I actually just write it in English. I should, I should clarify, I write that in English. It could be red or it could be Barack Obama or it could be something a longer sentence, maybe from your story, if you want. And the idea, as soon as you say go, is that the team, so each team, you know, there's four of them facing the board, their teammate is facing them and can't see the board. They have to get the teammate to say that word. So they, the teammate will be, again, I, I, I allow the teammate to, to say the word in English, but the team has to use the target language to get them there. You could, again, it depends. I just, I like to take that because there's a lot of pressure on that person. And so just to take a little bit of that pressure off, but to still get the benefit of the game, I allow them to say it in English. And so they have to basically say exactly what is on the board. Sometimes, for example, the one I did recently was um, a phrase I wrote on the board was Mr. Quigley looking miserable on lunch duty. And I was like, for this one, as long as you get the concept, you don't have to say the exact thing. And then the other one I did, and it was, it was great. I said, I'm going to write seven words on the board and your teammate has uh -huh. to say has to say the words in order and they're all horrified and then i just wrote on the board like i wrote all i want for christmas is you um and so they i mean so doing things like that i mean it was and again it's really fun so the the again the, the kids who are the students who are looking at the board they're using the target language they cannot sing they cannot make any gestures they cannot make any sounds and again i love this because it's you know the effective filter is lowered because they're just they're in it I'm not listening, although I actually am, but they're just, in, and they're really, because there's a goal and they're focused on getting that message across to their, their teammate. And it's great. And again, like no preparation. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, these are, uh, these are the ideas that uh, everyone will kind of put in their back pocket and uh, they can pull it out whenever they, they see a, a place where there's an opportunity and because of the, the low prep and being able to adapt them to whatever yeah. the, the different topics are. Yeah. So where do you continue to get your inspiration from? Like, uh, are there different places you're looking? Uh, what, what keeps you looking for more? Conferences. And I really hope that conferences can happen in, in person. Again, I'll be presenting some of these things at NACFO in, um, 
I have loved um, the Express Fluency Conference, which happens in the summer. It was in person, um, and then the past two years it's been in the cloud, conference in the cloud. I'm not sure if it's happening this summer. Listen to Bill Van Patten's podcast and read his books just to get that sort of um, underpinning. For me, I think seeing these things, one of the things I loved about Conference in the Cloud is that you get the chance to be in a classroom mm -hmm. where you're seeing some of these right. things um, happen, which I think is so key. But even the uh, one of the the games that you referenced was one that you were doing with an advisory group, and then you said, "Hey, I'm going to try that in my world language class." Yeah. You know, yeah. so you know sometimes that inspiration comes not necessarily when you're seeking it out, but yeah. you know you're playing a game somewhere and you think, "Oh, I can adapt this and use it." Yeah, for sure. And it's um, it's, it's some. I think we don't. You know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, I think there everything's out there, and I think that so often we're all stuck in our little cocooned away in our rooms, mm -hmm. and we're all scrambling to do the same thing instead of mm -hmm. just like I don't know, keeping it really simple. So and now that we've talked a lot about Kevin Quigley, the teacher, or Mr. Quigley, yes. or Senor Quigley, or Monsieur oh. Quigley, uh, uh, now this is the point where I like to pull the teacher curtain back a little bit and get to know Kevin a little okay. better than Monsieur Quigley. And I'm going to ask you a couple of this or that questions. So just choose one, maybe say why, just to get a little more insight about you. Okay, when it comes to food, mild or spicy? Spicy for sure. Oh. Do you have a, a go-to kind of food that you like for spicy? Um, I love, like, I love Korean food, and I we, uh, we make our own kimchi at home, and yeah, I love it. Um, Excellent. I know okay. it, it, the, the nice thing with the Korean food is why it kind of hits you and then it leaves. It doesn't like linger, so mm -hmm. you're not you're not miserable as you eat your as you eat your meal. So mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All right. The next one. Uh, do you prefer a scripted movie or a documentary? I'm gonna have to say movie. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, I ought to say documentary, but I'm saying movie for sure. Yeah. Do you have a yeah. movie genre that you prefer? Um, usually. Um... <laughs> Well, it's often, um, well, my husband will tell me that it's, it's, he thinks my movie genre is like depressing black and white subtitled European movies. I don't know if that's true or not, mm -hmm. but that's typically what I, anything with a really like um, <laughs> depressing soundtrack, then I'm like, I'm all over it. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least you, you know what you like. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the last one, uh, would you be more likely to go on a safari or a boat trip? Um, the boat trip, as long as I can get in the water. Um, <laughs> I want to be able to dive off of the boat, if possible. Mm -hmm. If not, then... Wow. Yeah, I don't know. Safari? I mean, no, definitely the boat, for sure. 100%. Well, thank you for that, for getting a little more insight into uh, to Kevin, a little better than Monsieur Quigley. Um, so I'm sure that there are teachers that are going to want to connect with you to maybe learn some more about games, share some game ideas with you. What's the best way to connect with you? Um, Kevin Demont is the handle. So it's, um, maybe you'll, you'll have a link. Or, It'll uh, be in, in the show notes. notes. Yeah, mm -hmm. perfect. Cause I'm not, it was when I came up with the name, it was like a really clever pun and now I'm, I'm now kind of stuck with it. Um, but okay, I have to say, I have to say this. I think it's brilliant and I love, I mean, it's, it's for, for French speakers. It's really great. Uh, yeah. but, uh, for it's, the rest uh, of you, sorry. it's, you know, it's supposed to be like, obviously or evidently or, uh, but with your name, I mean, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's pretty brilliant, I have to well, say. So I what I did, oh, well, thank you, I think you're the first person. I appreciate that because when I, 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 when I, I, had a, when I came up with it, I think it was like it was some, sometime during the pandemic, I immediately like snapped up all of the, the social media things because mm -hmm. I was like, I need to like, I'm not like super, I need to be better at the social media stuff. And I do have a website, which I want to, to work on, but you can reach me through any of those means. And I love, like I will happily email with people or, or mm -hmm. to chat with people and, and to share ideas always. So as we end, I would love it if you could leave us with just some quick words of advice about using games in the classroom. My, do my one piece of advice and is I have a list. Um, it's like a three page, actually it's not, it's a five page list. I'm happy to share this with anyone. This um, one page for listening activities, reading, writing, speaking, and then a whole sort of page of like cultural activities. Mm -hmm. That, and I have one for Spanish classes and one for French classes. That is on my desk all the time. Mm -hmm. 
And what I do is I, when I've done the activity, I'll just make a note on the list and date it just so that I know when the last time we did it was. I look at that thing every day and so, because I, I think it's too hard to remember because we come up with, you know, you have all these great ideas. We, have all these, we hear all of these things at conferences. Anything that I've done that I know works for me is on that list. Happy to share it if anyone wants it. Okay. All right. So people can uh, reach out to you through your website if they want to get in touch with that list to have on their desk as their go-to. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today to talk about this and for sharing all of your insights and games. Thank you. I hope my English was uh, (laughs) comprehensible. I think you knocked it out of the park with your English today, Kevin. Uh, Thank you. What are your takeaways from that conversation with Kevin Quigley? Hopefully, you're walking away invigorated to use some of the games that he suggested. Be sure to check out the show notes to connect with Kevin. You'll also see a link to sign up for Talking Points, my weekly email newsletter with tips and resources for language teaching. There are also links to get in touch with me if you would like to work together, either in person in your school or remotely. Talk to you soon. Bye for now. You've been listening to the World Language Classroom Podcast. Be sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're listening so you don't miss a single episode. Let's continue the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WL Classroom. You can also see over 250 blog posts about language teaching at, you guessed it, wlclassroom.com.